You Have Two Noses by Mike, Sidney, and Will. Some scientists argue that the human nose is becoming obsolete. As distressing as it is to imagine a world where glasses are now impossible to wear and Eskimo kisses are non-existent, could there be some truth to this claim? From an evolutionary standpoint, the human sense of smell has been pushed aside in favor of more primary senses, such as sight and hearing. We treat the sense of smell as base, a sense that is more useful for animals than it is for humans. But is this an accurate claim? In the scientific community, the existence of human pheromones is a hotly debated topic, even though their presence in other animals is widely documented. If humans do have pheromones, it could completely change the way we think about our olfactory system and possibly help explain some of the mysteries of human interaction. There are multiple forms of pheromones that we will be discussing. Dispersal pheromones are typically used to scatter a group. Alarm pheromones are used to warn other members of the species to a danger. Aggregate pheromones are perhaps the most famous and widely studied. They include the famous attraction or sex pheromone, as well as chemicals used to lead members of their species to food. To begin, we will primarily be looking at dispersal and aggregation pheromones in animals, and then move on to critically analyze whether or not humans do indeed possess this extra sense. One example of dispersal pheromones occurs in certain kinds of ants. A chemical is released by dead ants that alerts the rest of the colony to transport the corpse to a cemetery of sorts. When scientists isolated this chemical and covered a live ant with it, the colony proceeded to bring it to the cemetery, despite it not being dead. When the ant escaped, they continued to drag him back to the cemetery until the chemical wore off. One type of aggregation pheromone is the ever-popular sex pheromone. Female silkworm moths release a chemical called bombakil, which is dispersed by the wind and can attract males from several miles. When scientists placed a female moth in a glass jar, preventing the chemical from reaching the male but not obstructing view, the male had no attraction. However, when the female was placed in a mesh enclosure, out of the line of sight but allowing the chemical to be released, the male was still attracted to the female, despite being unable to see her. This proves that vision is not the driving factor in the attraction of silkworm moths to each other. The antenna of the silkworm moth are incredibly sensitive to this chemical, able to detect as little as one molecule of bombakil. Interestingly enough, the male antenna are considerably larger and more sensitive than the female ones. Pheromones have also affected the behavior of mammalian species that are more closely related to humans. Examining these will allow us to deeper understand our own possible connection to pheromones. For example, consider the mouse. Studies have been done that show if mice are deprived of their olfactory senses before being sexually active, they will never exhibit sexual behavior. This cannot be a coincidence. There must be some kind of connection between the nose and the reproductive system. The connection is slightly convoluted, but it goes through the brain, like most things. The ovaries and testes contain endocrine glands that secrete sex hormones. In females, the release of hormones is cyclical and determines the timing of her estrus cycle, or the release of an unfertilized egg and when she goes into heat. Controlling the endocrine glands is another gland, the pituitary gland. It's located here, at the base of the brain. It releases its own hormones into the bloodstream, which tell the endocrine gland when to release its hormones. A structure called the hypothalamus, located here above the pituitary gland, in turn controls the pituitary gland. It also releases hormones. These tell the pituitary gland when it needs to release its hormones. The hypothalamus gets its inputs from a variety of places, one of which is the endocrine glands themselves. When the endocrine glands have released enough sex hormones, the hypothalamus gets a signal to stop sending signals to the pituitary gland to send signals to the endocrine glands. Very circular. Another system that talks to the hypothalamus is the olfactory system itself. In order to understand how this happens, we must look at how the nose is built. The inside of the nose is lined with three kinds of cells. One has to do with breathing and nothing to do with smell, so we'll ignore it in this presentation. The other two are the olfactory epithelium and the vomeronasal organ. The olfactory epithelium is located up here, at the bridge of the nose. This is the system that allows what we think of as smell. The smell of chocolate, cologne, and the rancid stink of a full diaper, all through the olfactory epithelium. 
The receptors in this area transduce odorants into electrical charges, which then go to the main olfactory bulb and then the hypothalamus. This is the vomeronasal organ, located in each nostril. It looks and operates very much like the olfactory epithelium, but has some marked differences that encourage scientists to think its purpose is distinct. One notable difference is the physical distance from the olfactory epithelium. Another is that the brain keeps their offshoots separate. The vomeronasal organ sends information to the accessory olfactory bulb, rather than the main olfactory bulb, before going to the hypothalamus. The brain is very rarely arbitrary, so this separation must mean something. The separation occurs in all mammals, but so far scientists have really only been able to prove anything in lower mammals. One of the few well-documented cases of pheromones in humans is the synchronization of menstrual cycles in women. Most women will swear up and down that this happens, but one of the first studies that proved this occurrence was done in 1971 by M.K. McClintock. She had a group of incoming freshman women assigned to one dorm report the timing of their last menstrual cycle. Even though their cycles were at different times initially, they were synchronized within four months. McClintock went on to do further studies about why the synchronization happens. A study performed in 1998 by McClintock and Kay Stern took odorants from women's armpits and exposed them to other women's vomeronasal organs. The synchronization of cycles occurred even though there was never any social interaction. McClintock repeated the study using an odorant from one male donor. The variability between cycles de decreased with this experiment as well, but not to the point of the previous study using female odorant. As if women weren't affected enough by these suspected pheromones, an additional study done this year by psychologists at the University of Padova in Italy investigated the role of chemosignals on a female's rating of male mates. The experiment used either androstadienone, the most intensively studied steroid in possible pheromone, or a different control compound on heterosexual women. The women in both groups were then asked to view male and female faces while their eye movements were recorded. The results were that females at high conception risk spent more time looking at the female faces, regardless of the compound administered, and those at low conception risk only preferred female faces following exposure to the androstadienone. In essence, when reproduction is critical, there appears to be more of an evaluation of potential competitors. But when conception is unlikely, odorants or possible pheromones such as androstadienone might incite the same competitive response. As appealing as the idea of a bottle of pheromone-infused cologne may be to some people, Scientists still have a long way to go before they fully understand how pheromones work in humans, or if they even exist at all. As we've discussed, the existence of human pheromones is a hotly debated topic in the scientific community. However, we believe that there is some serious biological evidence to suggest that, at the very least, pheromones were once a vital component of human interaction, and perhaps may still play a role. Obviously, this topic requires much more research and study before scientists can even come close to fully understanding the role of pheromones in humans, but is certainly an attainable goal. After all, the scientist certainly knows what they are doing.